When I entered the university, a schoolmate gave me the following problem. Consider a set, say 3, which is, as we already know, the set containing 0, 1, 2, and take its power set, the set of all its subsets. Any power set is partially ordered by set inclusion. We draw the subsets lower as the lower elements in this partial ordering. And when there are two sets, such that none of them is a subset of the other, we say that they are incomparable. We are however interested in so-called chains. They are such subsets of the power set that every two elements in the chain are comparable. So in general, a chain looks like some path from the top to the bottom. If we start with a finite set, the size of the largest possible chain is just one more than the size of the original set. So the largest chain in P of 3 has four elements. The question is, how large a chain could we find in P of omega? What is the largest chain in all the subsets of natural numbers? The power set of omega itself has a cardinality continuum, but could we find an uncountable chain there? So we had some fun with the schoolmate for some time, and it turned out that, a bit surprisingly, there indeed is a chain of size continuum. Just later, I have found out that something like an uncountable chain in P of omega occurs in mathematics quite naturally, and it is called the real line. But first things first, how could we construct a real line? So far, we have just the natural numbers in the formal world. We want to gradually extend natural numbers in such a way that will not only lead to the new numbers, but will also allow relatively simple definitions of arithmetical operations, addition and multiplication. The addition and multiplication of natural numbers are already mostly established. When we take two natural numbers and we want to calculate their sum, we first interpret them as sets. We would like to take the union of these two sets, but we don't want the elements to merge. So we put the elements of the first set into ordered pairs with 0 and the elements of the second set into ordered pairs with 1. This can be also formally phrased as taking the Cartesian product of the first set with a singleton containing 0 and the second set with a singleton containing 1. All the displayed elements are different now, so we can take the union of the two sets. The sum is the natural number of the same cardinality as this union. Multiplication is similar, just that instead of the union, we construct the Cartesian product of the two sets. Again, we find the natural number of the same cardinality, and that will be the arithmetical product of the two natural numbers. Here, we match up the Cartesian product with a set containing numbers 0 up to 14, so 5 times 3 equals 15. Now we extend natural numbers to integers in a quite straightforward manner. We take two copies of natural numbers. Similarly to when we've calculated the addition, we add 0 to one copy and 1 to the other copy. The numbers with 0 will be interpreted as non-negative and the numbers with 1 as negative. So to construct the set of integers, we discard the pair 0, 1 and take the union of the rest. And of course, instead of writing integers as pairs, let's write them as normal people, although on the implementation level, the background meaning is just the ordered pair. The definition of addition and multiplication is a bit technical but straightforward. We just use the standard rules such as minus times minus is plus, minus plus minus is minus, and so on. But don't expect any more fun there, so let's proceed with the rational numbers, e.g. fractions. We encode a general fraction a over b as the ordered pair ab, where a and b are integers and b is non-zero. When we want to define multiplication and addition, we can again use standard school formulas. We just have to deal with a little complication. Multiple fractions can correspond to the same rational number. For example, minus 3 over 6 should be the same number as 2 over minus 4. But formally, the ordered pair minus 3, 6 is different from the ordered pair 2 minus 4. A natural solution to this little complication could be an additional condition that we consider only fractions in a reduced form, that is a fraction with the smallest possible positive denominator. So the pairs minus 3, 6 and 2, minus 4 are no rational numbers, only the pair minus 1, 2 is. With this, 
we also have to modify our school formulas accordingly. We have to reduce the fractions. This solution is probably the first that comes to mind, but it is not the one considered the most elegant. Choosing the reduced form may feel a bit arbitrary. Why have we chosen the denominator to be positive and why do we need the fractions reduced? So I would like to show one more mathematical method on the example of fractions, factorization. We have plenty of fractions with the same value. Minus one half, two over minus four, minus three over six. But instead of picking a single representative, we simply take all the available fractions and pack them into a set. This set will be considered as the single ration number a, which is equal to one half as well as to two over minus four and so on. Since a set is determined by its elements, such a description of a ration number is unique, just as when we've required the base form. It is just fair to the other representations now. Now let's take another ration number, b, and define the product a times b under this definition. So we take an arbitrary element of a, an arbitrary element of b, and we take their element-wise product. Then we find all the possible representation around the result, all the other fractions that can be obtained by reduction or expansion. Addition can be defined in a similar way, just that it can be even a little bit nicer. Let's have a look in both sets and find some representatives with a common denominator. Once we have it, it is sufficient to add up the numerators and, as before, construct the set of all the equivalent fractions. So even addition can be defined naturally using the common denominator without unnecessarily complicated formulas. Before we proceed to real numbers, let's notice that our constructions were not really extensions of the original structure. We started with natural numbers, but instead of just completing them by negative numbers, we have created a structure of integers with numbers corresponding to the natural numbers. It is even more apparent with rational numbers. Again, instead of completing integers with new numbers, we have built a new structure where the fractions with denominator 1 are considered to be integers. Yet, formally speaking, the natural number 3, the set 0, 1, 2, is different from the integer 3, the ordered pair 3, 0, and that is different from the rational number 3, which is the set of all the pairs with ratio 3. However, mathematicians are not really concerned with this issue, and they intuitively imagine natural numbers as a subset of integers and integers as a subset of rationals. Well, sometimes it is not really worth it to follow formalism too much. Finally, we proceed to the construction of real numbers. As usual, there are multiple ways to construct them. We are going to look at the construction using Dedekind's cuts. Where are the real numbers among rationals? We can take a look at the well-known irrational number square root of 2. Rational numbers can approach the square root of 2 arbitrarily closely, but they can never hit it. So every irrational number splits the set of all the rational numbers into two parts, the bigger rationals and the smaller ones, and reversely, Every such division describes the appropriate real number uniquely. So as we want to formally determine a real number, we simply take the set of all the lower rational numbers and declare it as the real number. This way we have described a formal representation of a real number, but not what a real number is in general. A definition of a real number shouldn't start with taking a real number. So this definition of smaller rationals rather serves as a motivation and a real number is defined as follows. It is a subset of rational numbers. By the way, the set of rationals is usually denoted as Q quotients, which with every element contains all the lower numbers. In other words, it must be an initial segment. All the other conditions for a real number are only to exclude certain special cases. In particular, it cannot be an empty set or the set of all the rational numbers. And it also shouldn't contain its largest element. Sure, with these dots it looks that the largest element is just the last dot, but we don't see plenty of other rational numbers in between. The reason for the condition is the rare case when the real number is also rational. In such a case, we could hesitate whether to include the rational number into the set or not, 
and the condition tells us that we shouldn't. With serial numbers defined this way, it is pretty easy to define addition. We want to add up two such sets, x and y, so we simply add them up element-wise. Let's say there are 4 thirds in x and 1 half in y, so we put their sum 11 sixths to the result. We do this for every pair of rational numbers taken from x and y. A set constructed this way is directly the sum x plus y. Contrary to rational numbers, there is no need for completion. Pure elegance. The definition of multiplication is similar but more technical as we have to take care of negative numbers. For example, there is minus 1000 in both sets, but minus 1000 times minus 1000 is 1 million, which is more than the product x times y, at least in this example. So if we want to multiply two positive real numbers, we take only their positive subsets. Similarly, as with addition, we multiply 4 thirds and 1 half to 2 thirds, and in general, we take the products of any pair of numbers we have here. In the end, we finalize the result by returning the negative numbers back. The general definition of multiplication when one of the factors can be negative is not so interesting case analysis, so we skip it here and rather take a look at another operation, working on the Dekin's cuts like a charm. Supremum. That is the operation, taking a set of real numbers. If the set has a maximum, it returns the maximum. And if there is no maximum, it returns the number just behind the set. When we look at real numbers as the set of smaller rational numbers, the setup is almost the same as when we looked at ordinal numbers as the set of smaller ordinals. The supremum is nothing more than a simple union of all these sets. Let's summarize all this. A real number, say pi, is in fact just the set of all the lower rational numbers. Every rational number is the set of all its possible representations. Every representation is an ordered pair of integers and every integer is an ordered pair containing 0 or 1. And as we have discussed in previous chapters, both natural numbers and ordered pairs are still just some sets, but we are not going to unravel their definitions here. In the end, I would like to explain the connection with the initial question about an infinite chain, although you probably already realized how it works. Real numbers form a chain in the power set of the set of rational numbers. Whenever we take two real numbers and interpret them as sets of rational numbers, the bigger number is a superset of the smaller one. True, the original problem asked about the power set of natural numbers. This is formally a different set, but both natural numbers and rationals have the same cardinality, alpha zero and the labels of the elements don't really matter in the problem. Yet, by taking rational numbers instead of naturals, we suddenly get an uncountable number of initial segments. Cool, isn't it? This finishes the formal real numbers. In the next chapter, we are going to take a closer look at one controversial axiom, the axiom of choice. See you then!